Thanks. So welcome everyone. It's great to have all of you here today. Really just wanted to give a little bit of history and, and just you know um, give a little bit of outline of the council and what we've been working on and then hand it over to our members to talk more about their technologies. But as we've all been experiencing around the world, you know, we're all seeing these intense climate events, whether it's droughts, wildfires, heat, um, rainstorms, you know, intense hurricanes. Um, it's just every community has been affected. And we're really noticing that this is part of the dialogue and really important nature of how we all work together to really start implementing net zero targets. And what we're also demonstrating is that, you know, when we don't have renewable energy 24 seven, we need that flexibility. We need that energy shifting and we need to be able to replace fossil fuels with clean energy. And this can only happen with long duration energy storage. Um, so it's really critical to kind of see how the marketplace is expanding to really provide societal benefits. And we've re been really working hard with our members and, and partners on promoting the critical value of long duration energy storage. Because not only are we providing flexibility, resiliency, reliability, and affordability. I mean, we want to talk about cost savings in addition to, to value add and a variety of sectors. So thank you all again for joining us. We're thrilled to be speaking out long duration and thermal energy storage, especially as we move together um, addressing all these different climate components. So what we're also really trying to promote, and just there's a huge momentum and realization about the growing sector and need for long duration energy storage. Every single one of our attributes in our economies, whether it's transportation, buildings, agriculture, you know, whether it's chemicals, mining, whether it's farming, um, you know, whether it's ports, you know, whether it's you know making manufacturing of different clothing or um, chips, computers, all of this needs energy and heat and power. And what we really want to show is that long duration energy storage is essential to all these different pathways in our economy and that we're really just trying to show is we want to work towards industry decarbonization and net zero infrastructure. Um, this has to happen with long duration energy storage, again, to provide the attributes of reliability, resiliency, flexibility, security, and affordability. As I've been traveling in, around the world, speaking at different conferences and working with different partners and communities, the nexus of energy security is so intertwined now. And so Again, all these new components that if we want to really work hard to achieve our net zero targets are going to need long duration energy storage. So another attribute we get lots of questions about, well, where's the fu funding, where's the financing? And just in the last you know, few years, we're seeing the capital stack change. You know, there's been billions of dollars invested in storage and long duration energy storage and just seeing the sector grow especially with a public-private partnership, has been tremendous. And we're also seeing not just equity, but debt being invested. And we're also seeing, you know, a lot of the, you know, the partnerships with government entities in various countries supporting the private sector to just, again, scale up. And we have a lot of technologies that are available to in the marketplace. Um, <laughs> what we need is to really make sure that, you know, they're able to scale up. And so that's what we're really working hard on is, you know, getting to that, eight terawatts of long duration energy storage that we need by 2040. And again, to note that there is the financing. So as we move into the flexibility, if you go back to that last slide, Larissa, I um, just want to highlight for everybody, you know, long duration energy storage really has these three core components of power, heat, and hydrogen. And again, really promoting the flexibility aspect of meeting all the different needs of the industry value chains. Um, we can provide this diversity of energy source, as you'll see, even in the thermal energy category, you'll see the diversity of technologies that are available, which is essential to our different needs in different communities. Um, we'll see you know, how important it is to reduce the renewable energy curtailment and how there's a cost savings because we're able to use that inexpensive power, the clean power. And we're also able to show how we can maximize existing infrastructure and whether it's it's, it's power to grid, heat to grid, whether it's you know remote systems, whether it's microgrids. Again, we just have a different ways that we can address the flexibility. And we'll focus today on the heat side. So just a quick overview of the council. Um, we're almost, you know, at COP27, we celebrate our year anniversary. We've been working really hard with our diverse membership of promoting fact-based information. As you can see, we have four reports on our website. We've been working with a lot of partners because we really want to provide this executive le level, global led perspective, bringing together all these unique partners and members. So 
it's not just our technology providers that are showing you this diversity of the four different types of long duration energy storage, the chemical, electrochemical, mechanical, and thermal energy storage, but also the customers, the capital providers, the equipment manufacturers, the developers, the system integrators, all working together to really validate and demonstrate the enormous need of long duration energy storage to meet our net zero targets and to really make sure that we're addressing scope one, two, and three emissions. So we're really thrilled to see our growing membership and our partnership you know, working around the globe you know, in over 20 countries and, and growing members of over 60 to really kind of promote again this diversity, whether it's startups, whether it's technologies that have been around for decades, whether it's you know public private partnerships, um, there's just so many different formulas that we can put together to make sure we're scaling up long duration energy storage. So today we're gonna focus on our thermal energy storage members, really wanna dive in a little bit more to all their unique capabilities and qualities, what you can see also from around the world. Um, you know, we'll get into this a little bit more, but you know, there are the four different types of long duration energy storage, this diversity is critical. And even within thermal energy storage, you know, we have the different degrees, different temperatures and of heat that can be produced in steam. You have, you know, whether it's solid to liquid or solids or salts. I mean, we want to look at the different categories and again, notice that diversity and cost savings, because, you know, our ultimate goal is, you know, replacing fossil fuels. We can do this with thermal energy storage and electric boilers and renewable energy, and we can be at cost parity today with gas plants. So again, just want to raise the awareness of how critical thermal energy storage is to industry decarbonization and to really show again the diversity and the products that are available in the marketplace today that need to scale up. So as many of you all know, um, you know, there's different types of thermal energy storage that can offer this flexibility, you know, whether we want to look at variable electricity to mechanical, thermal, electrochemical, chemical, and affirmed electricity. And what we also want to hone in today is on the variable electricity that we get from thermal energy storage, renewable energy. How do we create storage with thermal, and then how do we produce that firmed heat and the enormous amount of cost savings that you can get. Um, you know, it's really important to kind of show that there is, again, these different heat grades of flexibility, the different ways that we can store heat. You'll see our members highlight whether it's in bricks, volcanic rocks, salts, um, you know, cement. There's so many different ways that we can, again, hold the storage for days, months, and even years with an enormous amount of efficiency. And again, you know, just you have this intersection, this hybrid nature where you can have heat, hydrogen, and power. So again, the, there's a tremendous amount of options to work towards the different needs of the communities. And again, look at how we can replace fossil fuels with long duration energy storage, in particular thermal energy storage. I'm not going to take too much more time on this. I want to hand it over to our members so you can really kind of hear all the unique parts of their process. I mentioned the four reports. You can download them on the website. A couple of things I just want to highlight from our work that we did with our members in McKenzie on thermal energy storage. As we all know that 50% of global energy consumed for heating and cooling, the emissions um, are huge. <laughs> so this is truly a really hard sector to decarbonize, but it's not impossible. And working with long duration energy storage technologies, in particular thermal energy, can really start addressing these needs and really bringing down the emissions. So again, we're thrilled to kind of see how we're able to address this hard sector. We have solutions. We want to work with all of you to making sure we're adapting, changing policies so we increase the marketplace for long duration energy storage. We did highlight four different case studies in our report. Again, just really noting the importance of the entire sector of industry, looking at the different opportunities to bring in thermal energy storage. And again, the cost savings that you can have. Um, again, the diversity of you know whether you need over 300 degrees Celsius or 120 degrees Celsius, or you know even up to over 1,000 degrees Celsius, there are options. And whether you want to create green steam you know, clean aluminum, whether you want to work on district heating, very local, more microgrids, if you want to look at aluminum refinery, or even off-grid greenhouse and agriculture. All these different areas and attributes can be addressed with thermal energy storage. And again, I'll hand it over to our members to kind of speak more to this, but it's just exciting to see, again, the cost savings. Some of the main takeaways from the report of this $540 billion a year of savings with long duration energy storage. And when you install and power of heat. I mean, it's just tremendous. And just really seeing again, this system efficiency of electricity to thermal energy storage to heat, you know, 97% or higher is remarkable and, and happening today. And again, just the you know, rate of return and the kind of um, 
the investment and the savings that you can get is really positive. So wanted to again, just highlight all these opportunities, the value add of thermal energy storage and really promote again that this sector that everyone had said was really hard to, to work with and deal with because of this immense challenges of emissions reductions, we have a solution. We can work with all of you on, on really, again, meeting the needs of the industry. So I'm going to hand it over to our members to really highlight, again, all the great work they've been doing around the world. And also just note, again, thank them all for their time and their expertise, and again, pushing hard to work together to, to decarbonize. So I'm going to hand it over to Antor. Thanks for joining us, Jordan. Thanks, Julia. Antora provides a long duration energy storage solution really targeted at industrial applications that can address both heat and power. The vision we see, I think, is a common vision with a lot of the long duration energy storage and particularly thermal storage providers on this webinar, which is we see a future and, and a present where wind and solar represent the lowest cost sources of primary energy. Um, we've all seen the cost curves, wind and solar uh, levelized cost of electricity just, just declining over the past decades. But even beyond LCOE, what we're seeing is that there are plenty of cases where wind and solar power are already very abundant locally on the grid and are sold at a very low price because they, they don't produce, they don't have any value at that time and at that location. One of the goals of, of our company, and I think many of the thermal energy storage companies here, is to take that low value power and move it into um, new markets, time shift it so that it does have value. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So our technology is trying to link that vision, that low cost green energy to industrial processes. And the obvious gap there is that the availability of wind and solar, and more specifically, the availability of low value wind and solar is highly intermittent. And that's represented by this graph here on the left side of the screen. Wind and solar come along based on meteorological conditions, not necessarily when we need it. On the right side, we have our end goal, which is for industry, we need not only cheap and clean, but reliable dispatchable energy. And Tor is developing a modular thermal energy storage system that's designed to be the link between this low cost, but intermittently available energy resource and dispatchable energy for industry. If we can move forward one slide, please. So sort of lifting up that box uh, that you saw on that last screen, uh, our thermal storage medium is, is basically carbon blocks. I have, I have one here on my desk. It's a very safe, earth abundant, low cost material um, produce, you can produce this all over the world. We, we source ours domestically, um, but essentially we store energy as heat in carbon blocks. So we take in that intermittently available electricity and charge our carbon blocks. And we say charge, really what we mean is we just heat those blocks up. Very simple process. We store it as sensible heat, which just means we store that energy as a change in, in temperature without a phase change. So these blocks stay in a solid, solid state we heat them up to very high temperatures and we actually heat them up to high enough temperatures that they glow like a filament and a light bulb. So these are very, very hot and they are radiating heat out in the form of, of thermal infrared radiation and, and visible light. We then can then capture that light the same way you can feel heat coming off of an old school incandescent light bulb, capture that radiative heat and transform it into um, any type of, of really usable energy resource. Um, most obviously we can capture that heat energy as, as heat and create process steam or, or air. We also, and one of the key differentiators I would say of Antora is we also have a unique technology known as a thermophotovoltaic to reconvert that infrared radiation back into electricity. And a thermophotovoltaic is essentially a very similar technology to a traditional solar photovoltaic, except that uh, PV cell is tuned for the infrared radiation coming off of our thermal blocks. It's very high intensity as opposed to the lower intensity uh, light coming from, from the sun. Uh, all of that block is held within an insulated container. Uh, if we could just go, go back for one second, apologies. Um, so with it, that, those carbon blocks are contained in that, that last sort of module and that's essentially an insulated container. And that's important because obviously even when the wind is not blowing or the sun is not shining, we can continue to hold that energy for very, very long periods of time, just stored as heat in those carbon blocks uh, at very, very low cost. So it's a very cheap uh, way to store energy. If we could go forward to the next slide. 
So where, where are we as a company? Uh, we, we've just uh, finished construction of our pilot system out of the co-generation site in Fresno, California. Uh, that's now going through the commissioning process, but this box is basically one repeating module of our system. So the way that we uh, provide thermal storage is we basically produce these boxes that are produced at our facility and shippable via truck. And we're able to send those to the site and then instead of having a large construction project needing to take place at a facility site, um, we just have to do assembly of the modular system. We're really taking inspiration from uh, lithium ion projects, from solar projects that are done in this modular way. And you can see the rendering in the top left where we basically repeat this repeating module and certain repeating balance of plant equipment to bring uh, these systems to whatever scale is needed by the industrial facility. And as I mentioned on the last slide, the ability to produce both heat and power, we think is a key you know, differentiator of our product and of our technology. The vision that we have for this product is really to be a drop-in replacement, drop-in zero carbon replacement to the traditional combined heat and power systems that have uh, become so prevalent in industry. That ability to produce both heat and power allow, allowed us to address both of those energy needs for a facility from, from a single unit. Um, except instead of taking in natural gas as the primary energy source, we're now taking in a low cost but intermittently available form of electricity as that primary energy input and outputting dispatchable heat and power. So thank you so much. Um, we'll be happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you, Jordan. Um, we're going alphabetical, so I'm going to hand it over to Brent Miller next. You got it. Sorry, Azelio, I cannot. <laughs> uh Thanks, okay. Celio. Okay. Um, right, thank you. Uh, my name is Tommy Lindqvist. I'm the CTO of Acelio. We are a company in Sweden focusing on providing 24-7 power and heat to various customers uh, around the world. And, and the problem formulation is really the intermittency and, and the weak grids and, and the, really the search for, for power uh, at, at many places in the world. Our philosophy when we do this is um, developing a cost efficient um, and a long term, long duration energy storage solution. It is scalable. Each unit is relatively small, but we group them in clusters so we can scale from, from a few hundred kilowatts upwards to, to megawatts of size. We power them uh, at, during the day uh, with PV, solar, um, and we discharge them at at night, really closing closing the the twenty four hour cycle. The the markets we are targeting is is CNI agriculture and EV charging stations, um, and and those are the areas that we've done a lot of business cases to potential customers, and we know these customer segments fairly well. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, it is a thermal storage. Um, this is not uh, only heat, it, it is in terms of, of a product delivered to customer, it is both electricity and heat. It is. It works like we charge it with, with uh, electricity uh, to melt aluminum, aluminum uh, alloy at around 600 degrees C. And then once everything is, is, is liquid, we use the latent heat, um, it's fully charged, it's state, of, state of charge 100%. Uh, then at night, we pump and heat transfer fluid uh, around that uh, tank to heat it up and provide that heat to a sterling engine to pro provide power uh, to the customer at night. The, as a byproduct uh, from this process, because it's a thermal engine, uh, we can produce heat at, at the temperature of around 55 to 65 degrees C. And that is, uh, that, that low level heat is, is requested by, by several customers who ha has a demand for, for that as well. Um, right. Sorry. Um, and, um, and then you can dispatch that at any time uh, uh, during the day or at night. So next one, please. The, uh, we have presence around the world uh, from local sales representatives um, in US, Australia, South, South Africa, and, and the MENA region. Uh, we have 
deployed the technology in a solar park at No Energy One um, in, in Dubai, where we got one unit uh, powering the visitor center there. Um, then we have also a customer in Sweden, an industrial customer, um, and that one is providing heat and electricity to, to that uh, in, industrial facility. And we also have a farm um, in South Africa, where we've got eight test pots operating. Um, and, and also they, they have a demand for heat there as well, and not just only electricity. In the pipeline, we also have a service center in the US, uh, we have uh, agricultural uh, in uh, application in, in Egypt, in the desert. And then we also have a, a project in Australia for arbitrage um, uh, on selling stored PV uh, at night. So that kind of summarizes where we are. 24-7 uh, technology to provide uh, electricity and heat to customers. Um, and we have a, a couple of deployed projects and a few more on, 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 in the pipeline. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Bert Miller. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, so before I start talking about Bert Miller and its technology, just uh, one sentence about the need or the solution that uh, thermal energy storage uh, provide. I think that uh, Jordan uh, summarized it quite well in his uh, short presentation. I think it's about flexibility on the one hand, uh, having uh, a tool to capture that access uh, generation coming from renewables or uh, capturing low cost electricity during off peak hours and having reliability uh, on the discharge side, providing the customer 24-7 uh, heat, steam, whatever his needs are. So I think that's uh, what you get out of the thermal energy storage. Uh, quickly about uh, the company, and then I'll dive in into, into the technology. The company uh, was established uh, over a decade ago uh, by a team of ex uh, Siemens CSP, that's concentrated solar power, uh, with experience in building hundreds of megawatts of uh, concentrated solar power plants uh, mainly in Europe and in North America. So there's a lot of expertise and know-how when it comes to thermodynamics in the company. And this is why we decided to focus our efforts on decarbonizing uh, industrial processes and uh, thermal power plants. Uh, over the years, the company raised over $100 million. It is traded uh, both on NASDAQ and on Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. And we are currently around 60 employees. Next slide, please. So the way that uh, we do it, the way that the technology works, uh, we use crush truck as our storage media. You can see it at the top uh, right-hand corner. Uh, we crush it uh, into a uh, uh, small particles uh, sand light, and then uh, we basically store it in these thin metal cases, uh, which we refer to as B cells, uh, which finally form the basic module that you see in the centerpiece. So that basic uh, 40 feet module uh, basically is comprised out of hundreds of those thin metal cases, which looks similar to, uh, I would say, uh, sort of a pizza box. And that 40 feet module uh, holds around somewhere between a half megawatt hour to a one megawatt hour of thermal capacity. We then, we multiply to the required capacity for the customer, both uh, looking into the charging and discharging, obviously. We assemble it on site, we insulate it, and we simply connect it to the plant. Uh, you can see those set of pipings running alongside uh, the module. Those uh, four external set of pipings is where we insert uh, the resistive heaters. So we have embedded electric heaters uh, converting uh, uh, electricity into thermal energy uh, over 99% efficiency. And the centerpiece is for discharging uh, steam uh, to the client. Uh, next slide, please. A little bit about the project uh, that uh, we are currently uh, having. So on uh, the left-hand side is a project that we have uh, uh, in New York, just outside of the city uh, with New York Power Authority. Uh, it's basically demonstrating the capabilities of the system uh, at SUNY Purchase, uh, State University of uh, New York. There uh, we use a micro turbine uh, to generate electricity and then we capture uh, the exhaust gases to 
basically fill up uh, the system. And we also have electric uh, heaters uh, running inside the unit, uh, which we can simply switch on when we need uh, additional uh, thermal energy to provide to the client. I just turn on my video. I can't turn on my video. Anyway, uh, so that's a project that uh, we are currently in the final stages of commissioning. And then uh, we have another project uh, with uh, an industrial. Now it's working. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, so we have another project uh, in Brazil with an industrial manufacturer of uh, plastic water tanks. There we connect our system to a biomass uh, source uh, to provide hot air at 300 degrees C. It's for their uh, roto molding machines uh, to manufacture those uh, huge water plastic uh, water uh, tanks. And then we have a, a similar project that uh, we signed recently and now is in the engineering phase with uh, Philip Morris International. And that's uh, to decarbonize their operations in Romania. Uh, so we are replacing the natural gas boilers with our system. And there we are using biomass as well. Uh, in that particular case, we provide uh, steam for their uh, processes. Uh, another project uh, which is worth uh, mentioning, uh, next slide, please. So another project uh, is uh, uh, in a combined, uh, uh, combined cycle in Italy, a 390 megawatt uh, combined cycle uh, outside of Florence. And that project is with uh, Enel. Uh, it is... Uh, uh, in commissioning phase now, we just recently finished, uh, completed the construction of that site. Uh, you can see that uh, picture on the left-hand side is during construction and then uh, the final uh, constructed element uh, in the centerpiece uh, picture, you can see it. Uh, and then we basically take in steam, we provide back steam, uh, enable the power plant to work in a much more flexible manner and then generate additional revenues in the participating in the ancillary market as well as the wholesale market. Uh, I believe that's this last slide, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you, Gaddy. All right. Um, electrified thermal solutions. Thanks, Julia. Uh, hey, everybody. Dan Stack, CEO and co-founder of Electrified Thermal Solutions, standing in for Philip. Uh, his power went out. Uh, the grid went down and the generator went down. So that just goes to show the value of reliable energy, which we're here to help solve. So electrified thermal solutions, a lot of what we, what we say uh, is going to sound similar. We want high temperature heat, affordable uh, and reliable. So the dual high thermal battery, which is what we're developing, turns intermittent renewable energy into industrial grade heat. When we say industrial grade, we mean really hot, up to 1800 Celsius or even a bit more deliverable temperatures. We can do this far cheaper than hydrogen, three, uh, three times cheaper or more. And we can retrofit your existing process so you don't have to radically reinvent or redesign it to decarbonize the heat that goes into it. And so the dual hive sits at the intersection of the electric power sector. It could be a solar farm, a wind farm, a nuclear plant, a hydro plant, or just the grid with electrons on it. We absorb that power and we convert it and store it as very high temperature heat in the dual hive thermal battery. When you want that heat back out, we flow air or another gas through the system and we deliver high temperature gas to your process. It could be a furnace, a boiler, your kiln, or it could even be to a turbine to reproduce power later on when you want it. And if you go to the next slide, please. The innovation that allows us to hit these really high temperatures very affordably is roughly 10 years in the making, mostly during my time at MIT, which is electrically conductive bricks that can be stacked up to the gigawatt scale. And so on the left there are our full-size bricks that have been working with one of the largest refractory suppliers in the world to produce. So these are large-scale electrically conductive bricks that can be stacked up into large stacking patterns that we're showing here on the right. Basically, these bricks act as electric heaters um, where we can directly flow electricity through them and they heat up to very high temps. They have melting points well past 2000 Celsius, so we can hit flame temperatures in these bricks. When you heat them up with electricity, of course, they can store that heat as well. So they're also the thermal store, as well as the gray bricks around them that um, are creating the circuit. They also hold heat. When you want that heat back out, there's little air channels throughout there. So you blow air through or another gas and you have hot gas. So they're also a giant heat exchanger. So we have a three in one system. Uh, and it's an electric heater. It's a thermal store and it's the heat exchanger all in one box, all in one unit uh, without uh, standalone electric heating elements 
that uh, may tend to burn out or have OPEX issues. So we've tackled you know, this problem uniquely with these uh, bricks that we've been designing for a long time here and are now coming into fruition. And if we go to the next slide, we can show uh, what our commercial scale-up approach here is. By the end of the year, we'll be breaking ground on our commercial demonstration, which is gonna be in the five megawatt range, 25 megawatt hours of storage, uh, resembling an ordinary shipping container. Um, right now though, we're building our pilot system. It's about the size of an elevator and it's arriving, I think this week actually, we, all the bricks are there, all the electrical equipment is there. We'll be running the system at 1700 Celsius with flowing air, uh, cycling it and showing that our bricks can do what, we're, what we say they can do. We're looking for industrial engagements now to basically uh, execute on the pilot later this year or the demonstration unit later this year uh, and into 2024 to demonstrate flowing hot gas at 1700 Celsius uh, and setting those baselines now with the pilot unit. So I think that's probably under three minutes there. So happy to answer uh, questions from anyone uh, in, the, in the Q and A. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, moving on to Energy Nest. Um, Energy Nest was not oh, able right. to join, so we're going to um, advance through these slides here. And our next presenter is Craftlock. All right, Heather from Germany, where Craftlock is sitting. Um, we decarbonize and store energy for industries and energy suppliers. You can uh, move on to the next slide, please. Um, Yes, um, basically what we do is power to X and heat to X, so we collect waste heat and as many of my uh, of the other presenters already said, we uh, convert power to heat, we store at a maximum of 1300 degrees and supply it to district heating, to the repurpose of conventional power plants and of course as process heat in any shape and form to the industry. <clears throat> Next slide please. Yes, a bit about the storage, you, uh, Larissa, you can click through here. Um, as I said, 1300 degrees Celsius is our maximum temperature. Um, we are a modular scalable container from four megawatt hours to the area of gigawatt hours. Um, our uh, material is upcycled up to 85% from steel slags. So that is very low cost. Um, it has a specific capacity of up to one, uh, 0.2 megawatt hours per uh, cubic meter um, and we can design it since it's a synthetic material we can design it for specific characteristics um, it's highly durable so a material uh, holds for 15,000 cycles um, and uh, yes as i said it is uh, recycled from steel slags mostly uh, and harmless additives um, Yes, the net zero heat system is our electrifying system where we convert uh, power to heat. Um, maybe you know the Anico PepsiCo project. Um, here uh, we decarbonize a food factory from uh, food giant PepsiCo in the Netherlands, uh, 24, uh, 25 megawatt boiler, uh, which is fired by gas is replaced uh, with a 150 megawatt hours thermal storage of uh, craft block. Um, we care about conversion, the storage, and the heat transfer to thermal oil. In this case, we can uh, replicate the system for steam as well. Um, it's a big project, 8,500 tons of carbon dioxide are avoided in the first step, um, about uh, double of it when the project is finished. Um, and we totally replace gas by uh, renewable electricity. Next slide, please. As I said, we also uh, collect waste, waste heat, uh, which is a, a good use uh, or a good uh, build up for energy efficiency. Um, here we have a couple projects, uh, for example, um, next slide, please, Larissa. Uh, for example, our pilot commissioned in 2019 is ceramic industry. We collect waste heat over the week and then preheat it on Monday, which is a, a very small use case. Um, uh, one click, please. Um, yes, uh, in the steel industry, we have two projects at the moment, one in India, uh, one here in Germany. Um, we collect uh, um, from a center plant waste heat, uh, or we use burnt flare gases, which has a huge potential of energy. Um, 
and also for other projects we are in Australia making a feasibility study for repurposing a gas-fired power plant uh, and the same thing in Austria as well. Um, yes, yeah, so in some or summarizing, we have a very sustainable storage uh, that can uh, generate any kind of flexible process heat for the industry. Um, and as we showed, we already do so in several countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kyoto. Hello, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you, uh, Julia and the team to, to organize this webinar. Um, we are calling in from, from Norway, where we have developed a thermal energy storage solution that we call the heat cube. And you see this on this picture. We are a company uh, stock listed on the Euronext growth in, in Norway. And if you go to the next page, I'm not going to repeat all the you know, information that has been shared before in terms of the abundancy of, of renewable energy and how, how we can use it. But we are basically have developed a very modular system um, that can store the electricity whenever it's available and then make it available to the industry uh, whenever the industry needs it. We are clearly focusing on high heat demanding process uh, industries um, to basically discharge our heat in form of steam in hot form of hot air or hot liquids. Um, the, the idea of, of us and all the other partners and uh, companies that are presenting today is to, to utilize the, the cheap uh, energy coming from off-grid or on-grid uh, solutions and then um, dispatch it whenever it's needed. We are using non-flammable and non-toxic materials, so very uh, environmental friendly and very simple and, and abundant materials to replace oil and gas and, and diesel burners that are installed today on the industry sites. Uh, we are utilizing the existing technology. We are basically built on a technology that has been proven for, for 20 plus years in the concentrated solar power industry. And we are scaling a proven technology down. So instead of inventing something new and having technical uh, risks in, in scaling it up, we are taking a proven technology and scaling it down uh, and making it very modular. We have in, in, uh, basically gotten an, uh, or captured a company in, in Spain uh, with engineers that have built these CSP plants. And now we are reforming this into uh, a modular uh, solution as the heat cube is designed for. If you go to the next page, the, the key uh, features of the heat cube is that we can uh, charge the heat cube with uh, resistive heaters that have uh, capacity between 10 and 30 megawatts. And then we have uh, storage capacity between 16 and 96 megawatt hours, depending on how many tanks we are using. Each tank has a capacity of eight megawatt hours. Uh, so we can build the heat cube to the desired uh, demand of the specific industrial site. Um, discharge capacity is up to five megawatts uh, in the form of steam, hot air, or hot liquids, and in the temperature range between 170 to 400 degrees. Uh, what makes uh, the heat cube very attractive is that uh, the footprint is reasonably small. Uh, we can capture 250 kilowatt hours per square meters. Uh, and if you look at the installation, a typical standardized uh, installation of our uh, heat cube of 64 megawatt hours in size, we, we need around 260 square meters for that. Uh, with a height of 80 meters, uh, and each tank basically has a side height of, of 12 meters. The round trip efficiency is at 90%. And what makes uh, the heat cube uh, that is using the molten salt technology uh, very attractive for the industry is that we can decouple the charging process with the discharging process. So we are discharging and delivering the steam whenever the industry needs it. And we can charge the heat cube whenever electricity is available. 
And these two processes can run completely simultaneously and fully independently. And that makes us attractive to also operate in the reserve market since we can activate our heat cube in a very short time and uh, the heat cube can thereby be a very attractive asset uh, in, in the reserve market. The thermal energy loss is less than 1% per day. Um, so it is a very efficient solution and can last for longer than 25 years. We are in, if you go to the next, we are in uh, the final step of uh, commissioning our commercial pilot unit in Denmark, where we are replacing coal uh, with renewable energy to basically feed the local district heating network. And we are looking into, or we are operating now with various industries, particularly in the, in the paper, corrugated cardboard and food industry, but also in the, the chemical and uh, mineral uh, industry. That is very intrigued by our solution, uh, since we are meeting the heat demand that these industries are facing. We are collaborating with uh, financial partners so that we can offer our heat cube also as a heat as a service, meaning the, the industrial uh, partners pay only on a per megawatt hour steam base uh, while we are operating and uh, owning and operating the heat cube ourselves. But we also can offer it as a heat as a product uh, where we install the heat cube on your premises, but then the heat cube will be operated uh, by the local site management. We are working with various uh, partners on the on the technology side um, to further develop the heat cube and and expand further modules to also be able to capture heat uh, in the future um, to charge the heat cube uh, through excess heat. We are very excited about the process uh, and the, and the contribution of all these companies that we are present today uh, in order to reach the common goal of uh, phasing out fossil fuels and uh, very much looking forward to any questions uh, that we are happy to, to respond afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Rondo. Great, thanks Julia and team. Uh, the beauty of going last is that you'll probably hear a lot of the similar themes. So um, as you heard many times, uh, on this call, really the, the goal was to go after an energy storage technology that provides continuous, uh, very hot and affordable heat. In terms of the technology itself, it's a lot like the other technologies that you actually heard on the call. It charges electrically and it's able to charge rapidly from intermittent energy sources. So um, in many instances, we're connecting to an off-grid wind or solar facility, or we could also connect to the grid and charge um, from in the hours when electricity prices are the cheapest, when renewable energy resources are abundant. Um, and the way that it works is that um, it's a refractory brick technology that we're ultimately harnessing. So you could imagine a stack of bricks with wires coursing through, um, and the wires are connected to the electricity source, and you could imagine the stack of bricks would get very hot. Uh, we're able to get up to 1500 degrees Celsius. Um, as you've also heard in the same in the similar higher temperature range as you've heard on this call. Oh, sorry there, uh, Julia. There is animation on this slide. <laughs> um, of and uh, in this way, we're able to capture the heat and then deliver it at very high temperatures. Um, and we're able to deliver it in the form of either steam um, or or hot air. Uh, so in the in the context of steam, we're able to connect with the um, boilers produced by you know a lot of the uh, the big major players and deliver steam and connect directly to the steam steam lines on site. Uh, oh, next slide. Yeah. Um, so we have one uh, commercial unit that just came online at the beginning of this year. It is a two megawatt hour unit in California. Um, and it is at an ethanol facility. And we're in active construction of the next RHB 100, which has over 130 megawatt hours of storage capacity. Uh, and the customer will be announced in 2023. It's also in California. Um, but if you look at our product line, we have two standard sizes. So we have an RHB 100 um, and an RHB 300. 
Uh, as you can imagine, we are not as creative with our naming. So the RHB 100 has just under a, just over 100 megawatt hours of storage capacity, um, and the RHB 300 has just over 300 megawatt hours of storage capacity. Um, and they're meant to be modular. So looking at our industrial customer sites, um, oftentimes you'll see many of these units uh, side by side uh, connecting directly to the steam flange. And in this way, as you've heard repeatedly on this call, we're able to deliver heat in a way that is much more efficient than hydrogen and also much less capital intensive than hydrogen too. So this is a picture taken from our unveiling. Uh, if you are interested, you're most welcome to come visit us. And this is at Calgary Renewable Fuels. Um, so we're able to provide in this way a high quality industrial heat um, from a storage solution that is electrically charged to an ethanol facility. And those are just some more pictures of the event. So if you have any questions, definitely feel, uh, please feel free to reach out and, and looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Um, Torque was unavailable to join. And then we also have a presentation from 1414. I'm going to stop sharing and uh, let them share their screen. Thank you very much, um, Larissa and Julia, for organizing this. Um, I had the benefit of going um, last over here, and for some reason, this presentation is starting uh, somewhere in the middle. So, um, my name is Mahesh Mankadraman. Um, I'm the Chief Technology Officer at 1414 Degrees. Um, and our company is based out of Adelaide. It's a publicly listed company, and we um, uh, have been on the market for about uh, five years now. Um, the benefit of going last is that I don't have to emphasize the importance of long duration energy storage and the role it plays in decarbonization of the heavy industry specifically. So our system is quite similar to uh, what has been talked about in the past half hour from different technology providers, um, as in we have a renewable electric electricity source in into the box, um, the box is our core technology. We call it the Cybox thermal energy storage system. Uh, we use resistive heating elements for converting that electricity to heat. And it is stored in um, our proprietary um, thermal storage media. And air is used as a heat recovery medium and then supplied at high temperatures up to um, 1000 degrees Celsius for industrial processes, either directly into the process or um, for power generation. So <clears throat> one of the key things which has been talked about in the um, um, few presentations before this is around the um, storage density, the efficiency of the system in terms of the self-discharge rates and losses and the likes. Um, and that is why we like the latent heat energy storage system because it has the capability to have a very high energy storage density. And even amongst that pure silicon, is one of the highest um, enthalpy change while it is undergoing a phase change. And what we've done is added some herbs and spices to this pure silicon, uh, lowered the melting point um, for a desirable temperature of operation while still maintaining a very high energy density output. And our solution is basically a brick which has a latent heat property and uh, what we've managed to solve over here is the complex interaction triangle in terms of the material. So you have to mitigate the interaction of air with the containment material, the interaction of the containment material and the, um, the, the metal itself, and also um, isolate the metal from the air which is flowing through the box. And the result of all of that is a very high energy dense brick, which is modular and scalable, it is mass manufacturable. So the emphasis over here is on scalability and how quickly we can um, get up to scale. We've been working with um, refractory partners from around the world and using standard uh, brick pressing technologies which are out there in the industry and can be scaled quite quickly. Um, the brick is very robust, high energy dense. And one of the key features of this is that it is 
highly conductive as well. Just to give you an idea of scale, when you compare the energy storage density of Cybox versus traditional sensible storage energies, you're looking at a difference of a factor of uh, two or three in terms of the um, volumetric storage density of the, of the solution. So <clears throat> what I've plotted over here is um, the storage temperature on the y-axis and um, the, the energy storage density, which is depicted by the area of those circles. So in case of the cyborg phase change material, the, uh, the red portion is the latent portion of the storage and the dark gray is your sensible uh, storage portion. So roughly 60 to 70% of the energy is actually stored in the form of the latent phase. And as you can see from the plot, uh, you can store a much higher amount of energy into the, the breaks compared to some of the traditional um, storage solutions. Um, what we've been looking at is our primary focus uh, has been on integration with high temperature industrial processes. Uh, for instance, um, Bayer's alumina process where the calcination happens at above 900, 950 degrees Celsius, cement production, again, calcination based process, um, iron and steel um, pelletization process, and a whole bunch of different uh, commercial um, existing industries like glass, et cetera. Um, I presented some very preliminary results for the cyborg integration into these processes, uh, wherein for the alumina Bayer's calcination, you can reduce the fuel rate by up to 35% and hence the associated carbon emissions. And this is for a retrofit solution, not redesigning the whole plant, um, just incorporating a, a renewable uh, hot gas stream into the existing uh, processes. Uh, same goes for the cement manufacturing as well, uh, where you can integrate uh, the cyborgs into the calcination process and reduce the fuel rate by up to 8% um, and the related NOx emissions as well. In case of the cement production, you also have the added advantage of increase in productivity due to the way we can integrate here uh, into the cement plants. Um, our current technology focus is on the demonstration of our one megawatt hour thermal storage uh, module, which is currently under commissioning. Um, this will be testing the performance at one module scale and uh, future commercial systems would basically be replicating these modules um, and validating our engineering design models. And the other area we're focusing on is the commercialization aspect and ongoing engineering, engineering feasibility studies for alumina and cement industries. Um, and obviously the continual R&D for uh, improving our product. Thank you very much, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Um, thanks all to all our presenters. Uh, can you stop sharing? Um, we'll pull all of our presenters up here and do a few Q and A's. Seen there's a ton of questions that have been asked and answered by some of our panelists. Thank you very much to those who have answered some of those questions. Uh, for a few other ones to start, I wanted to ask this one was for Azelio, if you could answer, what are the continuous and PC rates for the system? Oh, sorry. LDS Council. Oh, to our burn? Okay. <laughs> um, all right, we'll come back to Azelio. Does anyone want to share? There are some questions about kind of the achievable levelized cost of effort will be in your in your various technologies. If anyone uh, would like to to answer that, I can try to give an answer there. Um, you know, in general, I, and I think anyone can disagree with me, but I think most of the tests shown has in general very low capex as far as. Uh, how that compares to the energy going in, at least for the electrified heat approaches we've talked about here, uh, the thermal storage itself, you know, you're looking at maybe a, a few tens of dollars per kilowatt hour capex. So then when you put in energy, you know, electricity, say it's on, you know, take levelized cost of energy itself in the form of maybe 20 to $40 uh, per megawatt hour from uh, solar or wind, you're only going to be a little bit north of that. And I think the net zero heat report actually showed some of that as well, where you had a few dollars maybe. Uh, per megawatt hour 
once you account for the thermal storage. So a small percentage increase. If you can, however, grab uh, cheap energy, say on the wholesale market or, or another, uh, you know, favorable rate structures, that's lower than that, uh, you know, levelized cost of electricity from solar and wind, say maybe sometimes negative or near zero, you can also get a levelized cost of, of heat near zero as well, if you operate and get those deals. But it really depends on where you are. Thanks, Dan. Um, at, yeah, additionally, one might say that it is uh, very dependent on the use case um, put in place, because obviously, if you need the energy once a week, it's a totally different use case if you use it every day and the storage is used more. So it's uh, highly dependent on how you use it, what for, um, and of course, uh, the price of electricity in most cases. Great, thank you all. Um, and, and just to note for all of the attendees, a recording will be available and publicly after the webinars conclude today. Uh, they'll be shared on the Eldest Council YouTube pages and you will receive an email with it as well for, uh, this week. Um, some other questions we have here. There were a lot of actually questions about kind of where you, uh, where all of you are, you know, kind of getting getting materials, and, and there are also some questions on on bounty proficiency. Um, if anyone would like to kind of answer that based on your your different technologies. I think we would just highlight to go back to the presentation, so it's all there and different questions. I think, Larissa, if we can, um, there's one question I think is really interesting about, um, you know, can can any of the technologies provide um, their heat LDES solution and how a typical number of how many units of energy can be made available per one unit of energy input? We can, and I'm thinking just about some, uh, yeah, go ahead, Dan, are you on mute? Or? Sure, yeah, I think most, folks would agree that, you know, at least for most thermal storage tech, you're, you're near one-to-one, -one, you're greater than 90% in most cases, I think. Um, you know, your heat leakage can be kept quite low with thermal, uh, you know, insulation uh, for most of us. And the actual conversion, at least electricity to heat is, you know, 99% or so, little losses along the way. Uh, for other folks bringing fluid in, it's going to come down to your heat transfer, but usually uh, north of 90, any other... Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, agree. we can say the same for heat to heat. It's almost just the losses of the days. And for a converting power to heat, it's like a 2% loss. Um, yeah, something like that. And looks like we have time for one more, one more question. Uh, this is for all the speakers. Do your customers demand both heat and electricity or do they prioritize heat consumption? I can answer on, on behalf of Brent Miller that uh, we, we focus on the heat. I mean, uh, that's where we just talked about uh, the conversion issue about the efficiency. We are all aware what happens to uh, thermal energy storage when it comes to delivering back electricity. Uh, so uh, when uh, we deal with customers, it's mainly, if not at all, on the heat side. Uh, I, I maybe can answer from a silly's point of view. I mean, we, most requests is for electricity only, but we can also, I mean, some of them are interested in heat, but that's an additional, that we don't sell it on heat only. It's it's electricity and if they need for, uh, for heat, and then that that's, will obviously lower the cost of electricity and, and heat. So, um, yeah. If I might add over here, um, it is very customer specific and the temperature range specific. So um, for, for industries which require high temperature heat, say 800, 900, 1000 degrees Celsius heat, uh, for them, the priority is the delivery of constant temperature, robust um, and, and continuous 24-7 uh, heat um, rather than electricity. And if you need to uh, provide electricity as well, the commercial uh, state of the art is fairly advanced in terms of conversion of heat to electricity. So the state of the art, I mean, standard equipment off the shelf available for conversion of heat to electricity. 
uh, the efficiencies are known for heat to electricity as well. So uh, that's not the challenging bit. It's the supply of the heat with uh, constant temperature output over a 24 seven period. That's the um, problem we all are trying to solve. Thank you all. I think we are just a couple minutes over time here. I appreciate everyone joining and thank you to all of our speakers and presenters today. It was great to hear about the diversity of thermal energy storage technologies available on the market today uh, globally. Uh, as, a, as a note, the presentation and the recording will be sent to all registrants, even those who are not unable to attend and contact information for each of the companies that presented will be included on the slides as well. I think most of them had them on their slides, but we'll, we'll make sure that it's on there if it wasn't. Thank you all for joining and we look forward to you joining. Uh, next week, we have a session on electrochemical technologies on March 21st. And please join that if you're interested in, in hearing more about those types of long duration energy storage solutions. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye.